That's good. Okay, we're about ready to begin. And so again, welcome to um, everyone that's here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we just finished doing a Jane's Walk in the area. Um, and so now we're going to do what we call the talk part. So it's a walk and talk today, um, all about Somerville history. And this is all part of May Preservation Month in Somerville. Uh, this is the beginning of it. We're launching it today. Uh, and there's many more things coming up. If you sign up, and I have a, a sign-up sheet here to do that, and you give us your name and email address, um, we'll put you on our list and I can send you out the calendar for other events rather than take up time now. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce two key people that are here today. Uh, one is Sharon Devereaux. Um, <laughs> Sharon is instrumental in actually through a grant that she received in doing a lot of exploring of the city's history. Um, most recently, she has been retaining um, Ed Gordon actually to do a number of different events about immigration and the economic history of Somerville. This is a repeat of something that she has done in March, which was terrible weather, but in spite of that, people stood outside the door actually to get in here on a Wednesday night to hear Ed Gordon's talk. So we decided to do it again um, and actually enhance it a little further. So if you were here before, you might even learn some new things. Um, and um, she has other events coming up as well, I'll let her mention as well. Um, and Ed Gordon is here. Ed, for those of you that don't know him, he's become pretty well known in the city. Um, I've actually retained his services a number of times, starting with doing some architectural surveys for the city of Somerville. Um, I, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm the executive director of the Historic Preservation Commission for the city. Um, I serve as staff to the commission, uh, which is a a uh, group of 14 individuals who volunteer their services to review um, historic pro properties that are designated historic going through um, some alterations. Um, I'd like to recognize that one of the aldermen is here at large, alderman at large, uh, Bill White. <laughs> he is a historical figure in his own right. He's also uh, very much uh, interested um, in Somerville history. He sits on the Somerville Museum on the Board of Trustees and has just come from a meeting there. Um, and another person I'd like to introduce is David Gus, um, who will raise his hand a little higher than that, David. <laughs> uh, he is also on, uh, one of the trustees at the Somerville Museum as well. Um, and he's responsible for oh, having done um, a wonderful exhibit about the Lost Theaters of Somerville many years ago you might have seen. Um, it's actually online as well, and again, traced um, all the theaters that used to be here in Somerville, which was a very informative and stimulating uh, exhibit. And lastly, I noticed that there is the uh, president of the historic, um, of the Somerville Museum, I should say, of the Board of Trustees, as well as the founder of historic Somerville, Barbara Mangum, who's going to raise her hand over here. <laughs> um, and she has uh, at one point also served on the commission with David Gus. Um, has since gone on to doing many other things. She and I work together very closely on the Milk Rose Cemetery. She's a conservator, and just so you know, I will let you know that we'll be doing a talk at the uh, Milk Rose Cemetery on, went, on Thursday, um, May 17th, I believe that is, um, from 6 to 8 o'clock. So if you've never been into the cemetery or known what it is, uh, the treasures that lie within, I suggest you come to that and hear all about it. We'll also be uh, opening it up on twice a week, uh, twice a month, excuse me, from May through October through a docent program we've started. And all of this will be online and the calendar that I'll send you if you give me your name and address. Okay, so um, let's get going here. I just want to mention that if um, you haven't already, there's food back there in the quasi food truck today uh, called Compliments. Um, a brother and sister uh, started this business and it's just wonderful to see that kind of innovation. In addition to which, we're selling um, these beverages here that we have some left if you want to purchase for $2. Come see me. So, um, Sharon, do you want to say a little bit about this? Uh, or you... It's really short. Yeah. Okay, so, so Sharon will come up next. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. 
And um, I want to welcome you, if it's okay, on behalf with David and Barbara, on behalf of the Somerville Museum, who is co-sponsoring this talk. And I also want to thank Mass Humanities. Mass Humanities funds amazing humanities-related talks and programming across the state. And we're really lucky that they're sponsoring this talk here today. As you heard, it's a repeat from our sold out talk with um, Ed Gordon on March 15th. And Aeronaut has been wonderful to host a lot of these events. Our next one at Aeronaut is Wednesday, May 24th. It's called Immigration and Somerville's Economy, a Historical Perspective. Um, it's a panel of six people, including three some longtime Somerville business owners. So I hope you'll consider coming to that one. Um, so just thank you so much to Mass Humanities. Thank you to Ed Gordon, uh, one of the public historian rock stars in our midst. And um, hope you enjoy the talk. And thanks again for coming. OK, that uh, uh, event will also be on the calendar that I mentioned. Um, Ed Gordon, as I said, has done a lot of surveying work for the city initially. Since then, he's been um, leading a lot of walking tours in East Somerville and Union Square in particular, which we do every year. Um, the Union Square tour will be happening in probably September, so keep your um, ears and eyes peeled for that. Again, um, it'll be on our website. We do have a website, the Historic Preservation Commission, through the city of Somerville. You just do the, the city of Somerville slash historic preservation, and you can learn about a lot of the different things that we do in the city. I won't go into it all right now. Without further ado, I'd like to say Ed, welcome, and thanks again for doing this talk today. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Brandon and Charon for, uh, and, and Ben Holmes from, from Aeronaut to having me speak here uh, again. Um, I just want to say that I hope you've had a chance to look at the handouts that I've passed out before uh, the program got started that have to do with the old Schwann Mill where I am the site manager and we have a lot of exciting uh, spring events coming up including May 20th, uh, a talk about quirky small uh, local museums in Massachusetts. Bill, Bill Hosley who will be giving the talk on May 20th at 2 at the Mill 17 uh, Mill Lane in Arlington uh, is a, an amazing repository of knowledge about uh, the smaller museums that sometimes get bypassed for those, what I call big box museums like the MFA. Um, so, so take a look at your, um, at your handouts. But um, I, I do want to get started and I want to say that this is a talk uh, that has to do with Somerville economic history from the late uh, 1700s up to about 1960. So, and it's kind of airing on the side of the larger uh, industrial complexes uh, like Charles North Meatpacking or Union Glass, uh, American Tube, um, and, and there will be a little bit of a representation of the more mid-size um, uh, kind of manufacturing outfits, uh, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, and we're starting up there on the screen with an image of the Charles H. North Company, which uh, was really uh, an, an enormous outfit on uh, Medford, uh, opposite South Street, in, at the southeastern corner of Somerville uh, during the period of the uh, late 1860s into the uh, 1930s. Uh, and we'll get more into the meat packing as we get further along in the talk. Uh, next slide, please. So we're starting with uh, what was a British military map uh, made in 1775 that had to do with representing where uh, the uh, patriotic troops had their military installations. And uh, over on the left center is, uh, is Boston, uh, before all its landfill, this kind of scrawny peninsula uh, projecting up there between the harbor and the Charles River Basin. Above that is Charlestown, and to the left of that is what will become Somerville. Uh, and Somerville, uh, aka the land beyond the neck, was the hinterlands of Charlestown. It was part of Charlestown, and I think um, people don't realize that Charlestown in the beginning 
you know, founded in 1629, used to stretch all the way to Lexington. Uh, and over time, it, it you know, was uh, diminished in, in size, but uh, it's amazing that uh, as late as uh, the early 1840s, Somerville was part of Charlestown, and uh, it would be in 1842 that it would become um, an independent town free, free of Charlestown. And that independence, uh, a lot of that had to do with the fact that by the early 1840s, Somerville uh, was having its own identity that was linked to railroads and industry. And there was now uh, a group of well-to-do uh, businessmen, real estate developers who had the capital behind them to stand up to Charlestown. And they had been you know, trying to get Somerville to be independent from since like the 1820s. And uh, you know, there were complaints about uh, street improvements were needed, um, and uh, more schools, better schools were needed. In 1838, uh, Charlestown you know, came up with the money for the first fire station, which was in Union Square on the site of the uh, central post office building, former post office building. Um, and so next slide. So just drilling down on a Boston and vicinity map, uh, what's being shown here is uh, what will become known as the Miller's River, which in the 17th and 18th century was called Gibbons Creek, Willits Creek. It's uh, called Willits Creek up here on the, 18, on the 1775 map. And uh, really the Miller's River is more um, glorified creek than full-fledged uh, river. It uh, is coming off of what was called Charlestown Bay, part of the Charles River estuary. Uh, Charlestown Bay, uh, no longer with us, filled in. Uh, it was just south of uh, Sullivan Square. And so, um, so the, what later became the Miller's River uh, is flowing under uh, Medford Street and continuing along the south side of the Fitchburg Railroad tracks, now the b and It's uh, making a hard right north, uh, paralleling Allen Street, up almost to Somerville Avenue, and then heading west along the south side of the railroad tracks. And then um, this little sort of mini brook branching off towards Kirkland and another towards Laurel Street. And we'll get to um, a discussion of, uh, of why the Miller's River is no longer visible. Uh, next image, please. Uh, now this is just to say that uh, in the late uh, 1700s, early 1800s, all was very pastoral and bucolic along the Miller's River, so much so that in uh, 1792, a wealthy um, Boston merchant named Joseph Barrell um, decides that he's going to build uh, himself a country estate in what is now East Somerville, Cobble Hill, where there's an office park today. And he hires um, Charles Bullfinch, the great Boston architect, to design this house uh, that he calls Pleasant Hill. And uh, Charles Bullfinch, as it so happens, is a young clerk in his counting house, in Barrel's counting house. And uh, Bullfinch is, really wants to be a full-time architect. And this uh, house project helps jumpstart his <coughs> career. Next slide. So what happens to the Barrel Mansion is that in 1816-17, Massachusetts General Hospital buys the Barrel Mansion um, and uh, it becomes the first McLean's Asylum. So the McLean's that we know today, um, the psychiatric hospital um, is now in um, Belmont uh, Waltham, just above uh, Waverly Square. But it starts out in East Cambridge. And the Barrel Mansion very rapidly is joined by wings that house patients. There were elaborate gardens, some of them left over from the Barrel years. And uh, McLean's will be on the Millers River, uh, will be in this area until as late as 1896. And by that time, it's hemmed in by tenements and industry. And that's, um, 
you know, causing them to move out to Belmont. There's a great book by Alex Beam, who writes for the Boston Globe, called Gracefully Insane, that will tell you everything you want to know about uh, this hospital that was for, uh, target. the target audience was uh, genteel uh, Boston Brahmins, frankly. Okay, next uh, image. Uh, and then uh, the thing that really starts um, uh, Somerville industry uh, on its way is the construction of the Charlestown Bridge in 1786, which ran along where the Warren Bridge is today, linking Charlestown and, um, and Boston. And this was a huge development. This is right after the revolution. The early federal government is starting to encourage bridge and canal projects with private money, uh, mind you, not uh, the feds don't have the money yet to really pay for infrastructure like this. But what, what this Charlestown Bridge does is it, it creates what we some of us still call Milk Row. Uh, Washington Street, Somerville Avenue, linking up with Mass Ave in Porter Square. Uh, and then going out into what used to be the farms and the hinterlands of Lexington and Concord. So this was the route that brought farm products, dairy products, to uh, market in uh, City Square, Charlestown, Fennel Hall, and later Quincy Market in Boston. So uh, this, this bridge will have a big impact. Next image, please. Next slide. Yep. So as it turns out, you know, Somerville's economic rise, yes, it's all, it has everything to do with proximity to Boston. Uh, you know, uh, historically, uh, Boston's industriousness was focused on its waterfront, the fishing, shipbuilding, maritime activities. Um, and, and then the rest of uh, old Boston is, is neighborhoods. There's uh, precious little land for uh, industrial development. So Somerville is perfectly located on the doorstep of Boston. It's also well located in terms of major, major transportation developments like uh, the construction of the Middlesex Canal that came down from the Merrimack Valley, linking that area with Boston Harbor, um, Charles River, Boston Harbor, 1792 to the early 1800s this 27-mile waterway that brought down uh, things like stone and wood, uh, building materials down to Boston. Um, it's uh, you know, 30, 30 feet wide, four feet deep, uh, major development, which is superseded uh, by the 1840s, by the early railroads. The first railroads come in uh, 1835, the Boston and Lowell, the uh, Boston and Worcester, later the Boston and Albany, and the Boston and Providence, the big three railroads in the beginning. And it's the Boston and Lowell that will be the first to go through eastern Somerville, followed by the Fitchburg Railroad in the late 1840s, initially freight rail. Then um, passenger rail becomes available on the Fitchburg in 1842. And of course, the Fitchburg, uh, a spur of that famously goes to Fresh Pond and Spy Pond in Arlington, and the ice industry gets going in the early 1840s, the harvesting of ice in the winter that's put into railroad cars, sent to the Charlestown waterfront, put into ships with tin-lined holes, and somehow the ice manages to get to hot climate ports like Havana, Cuba, and even Calcutta, India, if you can believe it. OK, next image, please. So um, right near the Middlesex Canal uh, were some of the early brickyards. And uh, the heyday of the brickyards is uh, the 1820s to the 1870s. There's one brickyard that hangs on until 1902. But what this um, slide shows you is the uh, Jake's um, brickyards that were located in East Somerville above Foss Park, above Mystic Avenue, that uh, get, uh, get going in the second quarter of the 19th century. Um, and it's, they're brickyards that are run by Colonel Jake's sons. Uh, Jake's family famously lives in um, what was the house of John Winthrop from the 1630s. 
and added on to over the years. Okay, so I guess my point is that environmentally, brickyards were not wonderful. The landscape was pitted. There were these ugly chimneys. There were these ramshackle sheds where the bricks were stored. Um, you know, a lot of the brick industry was uh, focused in the uh, Union Square area, literally the brick bottom area over the Wyatt Brickyards where Lincoln Park is today. Um, so, so, so the brickyards were a huge part of um, Somerville's economy, early economy as an independent town. But, um, and, and it's so timely because think of all the uh, streets in Boston that were built up in the south end with red brick uh, townhouses and a lot of different parts of Boston are going to take advantage of the, of, of the brick. Next image, please. Um, and then uh, just to get a little bit into the immigration uh, piece of this talk, um, you, know, the, you know, people are very familiar with the Irish immigration story that begins in the mid-1840s and uh, continues well into the 20th century. Um, and, and then what, what I'm showing you here is uh, the kind of hotel that a very affluent um, immigrant coming in uh, might be able to afford, like the 1% who are coming from Germany or, and Switzerland who are coming in into the US with mechanical skills with some family money behind them. They might be able to stay at the Tremont House Hotel uh, of 1828 at Tremont and Beacon in downtown Boston, which is considered to be the first full-fledged hotel in the United States with individual rooms and a dedicated lobby and restaurants, et cetera. Next image, please. But this is more likely what the uh, Im first immigrants uh, or the first wave of immigrants is experiencing as they come into Boston. They are staying in substandard um, boarding houses uh, in city neighborhoods like the North End. Um, and th this is a painting by a German artist named Karl Spitzweg called The Poor Poet, but it's showing this poor soul in an attic holding an umbrella over his head to keep the rain off him. Um, and uh, this also makes the point that a lot of uh, the early Irish immigrants in Somerville augmented their uh, factory income uh, with their with their wives taking in uh, boarders for extra money if their houses were big enough. So uh, between 1845 and 1855, 230,000 Irish folks uh, come in through Boston, and many of them don't stay. They go elsewhere, but many of them do stay. And they find their way to Somerville because you know maybe they have a relative already working at the Middlesex Bleachery and Dye Works or something like that. Next image, please. Uh, so here's the Middlesex uh, Bleachery and Dye Works, which was, used to be located where Conway Park is today, Somerville Avenue, foot of Central Street, uh, founded in 1821. It was one of the first industrial complexes in the United States to have steam-powered tools. Uh, you know, we think of the mid-1830s as when steam-powered tools become more uh, prolific and more available. Uh, this is uh, really a textile finishing mill. It's coming in right at the same time as the textile mills of Lowell. Uh, that city, that, that all was starting in the early 1820s up in Lowell. So it's very, very early. It predates the, uh, the railroad story. Um, you know, 15 years ahead of itself, uh, and it will be in business until as late as 1936, and then the Depression uh, makes it no longer possible for them to function. Next image, please. Um, one of the things that, one, one of the companies that gets started in response to the availability of the railroads is Hi Hiram Allen's Rope Walk. And uh, a rope walk uh, is a usually a long rectangular shed where hemp inside is woven into rope uh, by uh, several workers. And the image that you see here is actually the interior of a rope walk in mid-19th century Liverpool, England. It was like impossible to find, you know, plenty of exterior images of rope walks and places like 
uh, mystic seaport, but not so much interior. So, you know, here, here are the workers uh, weaving the rope, uh, the hemp into rope. And this was located, do you know where Allen Street is off of Somerville Ave? It, it goes from Somerville Ave up to Charlestown Street. Then you take a left and it goes into one of the big box like targets. Um, so, so Hiram Allen jumps at the chance to be located near the Fitchburg Railroad. He will be in business until the mid to late 1860s. Uh, it's a small operation. He's only employing five to eight men at any given time. But he's creating rope for the maritime industries over in Boston. Next image, please. Um, and then this is uh, a detail of the 1852 Martin Draper map which shows the Millers River coming, you know, coming in upper, uh, upper right, uh, flowing through these two pond-like uh, bodies of water on either side of Medford Street. Um, and this will become a kind of ground zero urban crucible, however you want to put it, uh, for what will soon be the evolving meatpacking industry. Uh, factories where uh, meat, where uh, all manner of livestock, cattle, sheep, hogs, etc., are uh, slaughtered. The meat processed, the meat packaged, the meat distributed, uh, and so you'll have uh, big outfits like uh, J.P. Squire and Company, which is Squire is like 90% in East Cambridge and a small sliver in East Somerville, but I'm going to include him because he is so key in getting this meatpacking story off the ground in Somerville. Um, we're not quite ready to talk about him. Uh, next, next slide, please. And then this is the um, larger image of the Martin Draper map of 1852 that shows Somerville, all four square miles of it. Seems like more to me, but that's the figure that's kind of bandied about, four square miles. Um, that at this point in time, it's 10 years after independence, there's lots of open space uh, to build factories and to build housing. Um, at this point, uh, in 1842, when Somerville breaks away, the population is 1,000. By 1860, it's 8,000. And by 1870, it's 15,000. So, um, so here it is, you know, not too much to not too much development yet. The industry isn't polluting the Millers River terribly much yet. Um, next image, please. So that by 1910, you've got just about all of Somerville streets la uh, laid out. Uh, by this time in 1910, there are 60,000 people living in Somerville. Uh, between uh, 1890 and 1910, 50% of um, Somerville's building stock is built. This is when you, you look in the business directories and there are all these architects and contractors and stair builders and specialized builders. Uh, it's, it's an amazing period in the town's history. Um, cities, um, next image please. And, and so this is showing you this important crisscrossing of railroad tracks. Uh, yes, the um, running east-west, the Fitchburg Railroad, but now by 1855, running um, north-south will be the Grand Junction Railroad. And what the Grand Junction does is, it is uh, linking the Boston and Albany Railroad uh, down by the Cottage Farm Bridge over to the BU campus. It's uh, allowing for um, uh, cattle and other animals coming in from the Midwest to then be put into uh, cars that are going to move north into Somerville. And the availability of this north-south rail link, uh, th this is brought to the attention of uh, John P. Squire, who starts out in 1842 in uh, Fennel Hall, Quincy Market. He has a stall there selling meat. And um, he is from Vermont originally. And as it turns out, when he was in, living in Vermont, a neighbor of him was Charles H. North, who was about a decade younger. 
and, and they you know, know each other, growing up together, and Charles North will work for Squire at uh, Quincy Market, and then they'll go their separate ways, but they will have slaughterhouses across the Medford Street from each other. So you know, here's this important rail length, the Grand Junction, that um, you know, makes uh, Squire uh, decide that he wants to go over to East Somerville and East Cambridge. Next image. Uh, and then um, I just threw this in to say, here's the ultimate railroad experience in the late 1860s, the, the, the um, Transcontinental Railroad, which um, comes together in 1867 and allows East Coast, West Coast, uh, continuous rail transportation. Uh, that the A&P, among other companies, will take advantage of. Next image, please. Uh, here is some of the early workers' housing. This happens to be on Linwood Street. It's no longer there. It's in the Brick Bottom neighborhood between Linwood and Joy, uh, between the Fitchburg, uh, Boston and M, B and M tracks, and Washington Street. And this is just to make the point that the brickyard land just becomes. Uh, it becomes very valuable for, for residential construction. And um, so the brickyards fall by the wayside. The housing comes in. It's worker housing. Um, and it will remain housing up until the 1920s, when you have interesting developments like the coming of the A&P Food Distribution Center um, and some other uh, industrial developments. Um, so, uh, and, and I also want to make the point that of all the worker uh, neighborhoods, Brick Bottom was the biggest melting pot of all with Irish, Greeks, Italians, Portuguese, other ethnic groups living side by side, block after block. It's not a very big area, but there's a wonderful uh, map, a plan in the possession of the Brick Bottom Art Association that somebody created in the 1950s that has the names of all the families or most of the families who lived on these blocks. And you can see with your own eyes that this was like a, a United Nations of folks living over in Brick Bottom. Next image. Uh, one of the uh, Brick Bottom industries that have hung on since the 1890s is the Kiley Automotive Company, which starts out making uh, wagons and wagon wheels in the 1890s. They're still hanging in there on Linwood Street. Next image. Uh, and then, uh, okay, so now we're getting into the 1850s. And this is when we're not talking about the small rope walk story so much as we're talking about the big uh, industrial complexes that have campuses, that have multiple buildings. And this is a little bit of out of chronological order. But 1854 is when Union Glass is started uh, by Amory and Francis Houghton. And they start out with New England Glass in East uh, Cambridge. And then they start uh, Union Glass in uh, Somerville in 1854. And they famously are kind of like the father or grandfather of Corning Glass in upstate New York and Ithaca. Uh, Corning Glass is kind of ultimately a spin-off of Union Glass. And, and the Houghtons, um, name it Union Glass because they wanted to make it clear that they were Union sympathizers, uh, and I suppose this was for the purposes of their Southern clients because their product, which was industrial glass, all kinds of things like doorknobs and railroad lanterns, and um, they, uh, they, they wanted to be known for their Union sympathies. And they will be making their utilitarian glass fixtures until the early 1880s, when then they get more invested in, in um, Corning Glass, and then a, a very interesting man named Julian de Cordova comes in and takes over the company, and he's interested in art glass, in uh, you know fancy vases and uh, bowls and uh, compotes and all kinds of things, and. Um, what we're looking at here is a catalog for one of Union Glass's early 20th century glass catalogs. Um, and yes, this is the same de Cordova for whom the de Cordova Museum out in Lincoln is named. That museum and sculpture park was uh, started with de Cordova's money in the early 1950s. Next image. Uh, and then we have um, 
th this is the World's Fair of 1893. Union Glass products were famously uh, displayed at the World's Fair. Uh, they were also displayed on Fifth Avenue in the window of Tiffany's. Uh, Union Glass was perhaps the most famous of all, um, had a very wide reach of all the um, Somerville Industries. Next image. Uh, and then here is a relatively rare photograph that Christy Chase found in one of her searches that shows um, Webster Avenue on the right with the smokestacks of Union Glass and some of the buildings. Those buildings are all completely gone. Um, but uh, it was this real uh, rip-roaring uh, industry for, for a lot of years. Next image. Uh, and then, you know, practically right out the front door here, uh, American Tube Works, which is started in 1851. Uh, and, and it's interesting because the uh, group of men who start American Tube, including a man named Freeborn Adams, who was a mechanical wizard who was associated with some of the iron works in South Boston, uh, they go to Britain and they study British industries and they somehow get the rights to, um, to, to replicating uh, British tubing that will be used for steamships, for railroads, uh, and also uh, smaller scale piping, uh, you know, for domestic use. And so uh, this company will be around from 1851 into the 1930s, and it goes through two distinct building phases. The first phase, the 1850s and 60s buildings, come down in the 1890s and early 1900s for like then a brand new campus, which lasts until the uh, 1930s. What we're looking at here is the blacksmith shop building, which is the oldest of the second wave buildings from the 1890s, right next to um, the market basket. Uh, parking lot. Next image, please. Uh, and then we, then we have what I think could be called uh, the Church of the Immigrants. Uh, St. Joseph's Roman Catholic Church, which is built between 1870 to 1874, Patrick Murphy architect. And um, by 1870, there were uh, 2,000 Catholics living in Somerville. Most of them were Irish Catholic. <coughs> Uh, before 1870, if they wanted to go to church, they had to walk into Cambridge, they had to walk into Charlestown. Uh, there was uh, a bit of resistance here in Somerville. Uh, I think that's maybe an understatement, but sadly, uh, there was a resistance to uh, Roman Catholics getting too settled in here uh, because there was fear, believe it or not, of the power of the Pope, would you believe? There was even a political movement uh, called the Know Nothing Party, aptly named, um, that were active in the 1850s. And it was very hard for Catholic churches to get um, started in the Boston area. There were stories of St. Gregory's and Dorchester Lower Mills. They're halfway through building the church. It's burned in the middle of the night by anti-Catholic uh, Protestants. So it's a long haul to get to this place, to have uh, St. Joseph's, and uh, I think it's so interesting that two Monsignors, two priests associated with the church, uh, McGrath and O'Brien, have a, a highway name for them. Do you know of any other city in the U.S. that would have a highway named after priests? That's, that's very interesting. Um, next image. This is in Union Square, of course. And then what we have here is an 1882 cartoon. I forget what publication this is, but it shows the rough and tumble of Quincy Market, the place where Squire and North, uh, you know, get their businesses started, and then they move over to um, to Somerville. Next image, uh, and then a bird's eye view of 1877 uh, that is literally sort of like an aerial view, looking down at the intersection of the Fitchburg Railroad and Medford Street. Uh, where the Charles H. North Company buildings are were located. There are two that survive. Uh, and it's so interesting because the big three meatpacking companies were in this area. 
Squire, all about beef in the, um, in, in the mostly in East Cambridge, the North, who was about pork, and then the New England um, meat and uh, dressed meat and wool business over where the Target store stands at Somerville Ave in Medford. Uh, you know, you've got the big three meatpacking giants uh, right there, and by the 1870s and 80s, you have this buildup of terrible pollution. Uh, you have um, just horrific uh, animal body parts going into the uh, middle uh, Miller's River, the rivers of blood. I mean, you you know, go read the descriptions, uh, and the air is foul, and there's uh, reports of. It was so bad that the paint peeled off of housing in the area. Terrible environment to raise children, needless to say. Uh, next image. And so here's the surviving Charles H. North administrative building on Medford Street. And then uh, down at the end, it'll turn into Paul Gore, which goes into East Cambridge. And quite a handsome building from uh, the 1880s when North has to rebuild after a fire. Next image. Uh, and then the Squire uh, Company uh, next door, which, um, you know, it was Squire that caused uh, Somerville to be called the Chicago of New England, that after Chicago, uh, Somerville was number two or three in terms of uh, the meatpacking industry. And Squire will go out literally in a blaze of glory in 1963 when there's uh, this huge fire in East uh, Cambridge that does away with the last Squire buildings. Um, next image. And then, you know, just to, just to say that Squire was living a lot of the year in rural bliss out here on Mass Ave in Arlington, three doors down from the Capitol Theater in an 1850 house that's still there. Um, and you know, and this is the thing, the captains of industry could live in places like Longwood Cottage Farm in Brookline uh, and all these kind of uh, places out in the countryside and ignore what their businesses were doing. Uh, next image. And so by the early 1900s, the conditions in War II, Medford Street, Ward Street, South Street, Horace Street especially. Uh, people uh, in, for child welfare services are very concerned about the child labor. Um, and so uh, a very important photographer named Lewis Hine, who was uh, one of the progressives, the so-called muckrakers, who were hard at work during the Teddy Roosevelt administration, trying to break up uh, these huge monopolies and, um, you know, writers like Upton Sinclair, who write a book called The Jungle, which is about the evils of the meatpacking industry. I believe that was focused on Chicago. And um, Ida uh, Tarbell, who wrote about uh, the evils of industry involving child labor. So what you're seeing here is uh, a young Italian girl on Horace Street She's uh, part of a collective of children who made crocheted clothing products. Uh, next image. And so here is an interior of a Horace Street house with the father on the left, perhaps instructing the kids how to make cro crocheted uh, coats and little hats and things like that. And so Lewis Hine, his Photography, not unlike Jacob Reese in New York, that exposed the Lower East Side tenement problems, um, he is instrumental in getting a sweeping Child Welfare Act in 1916 passed through Congress under Woodrow Wilson. Next image. Um, so down in this meatpacking area, um, there is what was what used to be the George uh, Norton. Um, soap company at Horace and Ward. And of course, uh, soap is made out of bones and byproducts, fat that was like a byproduct of the meatpacking industry. And this is actually a very old company that was started in 1820 
His son carries it forward into the early 20th century in this building of 1903. And in the back of that building is the Somerville Brewery that um, you know, has a restaurant and a brewing operation. Um, uh, next image. And then um, another uh, interesting later development is the Fresh Pond Ice Company off of Washington Street in the Lincoln Park area on the other side from Lincoln Park up against the Fitchburg Tracks and uh, very briefly in 1882 there is a late entry to the Fresh Pond ice industry in Cambridge um, in addition to the Boston Manufacturing Company of Frederick Tudor uh, there is now an ice company that specializes in getting the ice out to local people because this is the beginnings of the icebox for residential use, the Eddy icebox famously made in Dorchester. And so these are the horse-drawn carts with ice in them going out into the neighborhood selling ice. And uh, part of the company was based here, and a couple of the buildings are left. Ne next image, please. Uh, Peter Forge, who some of us saw on the Jane's Walk tour of 1881, still in business five generations later. They start, making, they start out making fancy ornamentation for high-end furniture during uh, the 1880s. And uh, very quickly, they get into making small metal parts, like metal stamping and washers and all kinds of very useful utilitarian uh, parts for machinery. And in the World War I era, they famously made the metal helmets for the U.S. Doughboys, the GIs who were fighting in France. Um, and they were, you know, home to generation after generation of immigrant workers who got their start at Peter Forge and uh, were able to learn English under the kind um, regimes of the, of the Forge family. Next image. Uh, Derby Desk Company, Vernon Street, where the Vernon, Vernon Street artist lofts are today. Uh, it was George Derby who coined the term um, Derby Desk in the early 1880s, the roll top desk. Next image. Um, here we have, you know, I think it's largely forgotten that Somerville and Eastern Charlestown were major centers for the production of mustard and spices and um, I'm forgetting something else that I wanted to mention, but um, a man named Emerson rented land from the Tufts family in what is now Powderhouse Park. He had a factory in Powderhouse Park, and on top of a commemorative boulder are bronze um, sculptural uh, figures of the Powderhouse pickle jars that he uh, produced. Um, okay, next image. Uh, and then uh, this is getting us into the early 20th century, into um, 1925, when the A&P Company, which by the way got started in 1859 in New York City, and uh, was really the first chain store of any kind in the U.S., even, a, even ahead of the Woolworths in terms of chain stores. And in 1925, the um, you know, the, the Huntington Hartford family figures it out that East Somerville is really well poised in terms of transportation, getting out their product. Uh, it's, you know, yes, right next to the railroads, but it's right next door to the McGrath and O'Brien Highway, which was at first called the Northern Artery. And, um, you know, so that's going to be a way to get there automotive trucks out into wherever they need to go in eastern Massachusetts. So this complex, it will have a cannery, a bakery, a storage facility, a garage where they can repair their trucks. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it will be a place uh, where they can get their products uh, out into um, where, wherever they need to go. You know, and it was just, um, fortuitous that when the street pattern was laid out over there in 1857, Fitchburg Street was laid out very wide. That was, you can see that on the 1857 plan. 
And people are like, you know, why does it need to be that wide? But in the 1920s, that was a very helpful thing. There are photos somewhere of all these A&P uh, trucks that are about to leave the facility. And of course today, this is the Brick Bottom Artists Association, has been since the late 1980s. Uh, next image. Uh, and then here is the main building on Fitchburg Street. And uh, what this represents is a fairly early large-scale use of concrete. Concrete is a material that's um, first kind of explored by the Romans, uh, you know, going back to ancient Rome. And then it's revisited in, in Britain during their Industrial Revolution in the 1700s. And then it pops up again in this country in the mid-18th century. And uh, in 1903, Harvard Stadium uh, over there on um, North Harvard Street. That will be the largest ferro-concrete structure in the world when that's built in 1903. By what I mean by ferro, that means reinforced by, by iron mesh or iron rods. OK, so early use of concrete. Um, you know, here's an example of an early uh, A&P store, next uh, image. Uh, okay, here, here's the garage that's now part of the art complex, uh, next image. Uh, an old A&P price list. Uh, I don't know if these are quite coupons yet, but uh, you know, 10 cents for a jar of peanut butter, that's pretty good. And then uh, next image. Oh, and then, okay, and then, and then this, this is just for I don't know, I just love this fact that uh, the Huntington Hartford family that owned the A&P company for all those decades uh, tried to start their own art museum at Columbus Circle in Manhattan. And it was short-lived because the grandson in this story was a sometime movie star and playboy who ran through his money. And, uh, but uh, in 1964, he tries to, tries to start a contemporary art museum at Columbus Circle, and that doesn't work out so well. And uh, now, for about a decade, it's been the Museum of Design and Craft, and they seem to be more successful at keeping an uh, art museum there. But I love the fact that this was a family, you know, who started the A&P, who were into the arts, and there's an artist group living in their food distribution complex. Next image. Uh, and then, you know, here, here's the Brick Bottom Art Gallery when the toy camera exhibit was there not so long ago. Next image. Um, and then, you know, where the, where the loading shed is located, that's now an atrium. Next image. Uh, and the loading docks have been turned into wonderful gardens, and it's important to keep the loading docks in any kind of an industrial recycling because you want evidence of you know, when it was a working uh, industrial complex, next image. And then we get into still the mid-1920s, uh, the coming of the Ford assembly plant to East Somerville, northern East Somerville, north of Mystic Avenue. They have to do some uh, land making to get that, you know, area up to speed so they could build on it because there were a lot of wetlands associated with the Mystic River. And uh, what will ultimately do the cut this part of the Ford outfit in is that in the late 1950s, this is the principal plant for producing the Edsel car. And of course, Edsel is now synonymous with clunker. Somewhat, someone on the Jane's Walk tour said, oh, I really like that design. I thought it was a good car. So, you know, but a lot of people didn't share that opinion. Um, and so in the late 50s, the Ford plant kind of fell apart. That was a major, needless to say, major Somerville employer that, uh, you know, millions of dollars in tax revenue now, you know, no longer available to the city. And it's taken decades for that area to get figured out. Uh, we're talking um, Assembly Row, Assembly Square, uh, a couple of the big box stores, I think Kmart, didn't hear and you'd like to know more about um, because he's a wealth of information as you can tell um, and so I hope you'll speak up or any observations that your memories that you might have a continuation of the Jane's Walk where um, we ask people to share um, some of their own observations about the city and, and the transition that's going over time 
Um, I might mention that Alderman White um, was also the president of the Alderman um, for many years now, and it makes it historic. Um, grew up in the city and Somerville Avenue, not too far from here, and I don't know if he wants to share anything about that, because I know he has a long history in the city and, and many memories, and so it'd be wonderful if he is interested in coming up and doing that. <laughs> First, I want to thank you very much for the presentation. And I grew up on uh, Rossmore Street, which is right near the Target. Um, there's the Burger King down there. And actually, when I was a kid, there still was the last operating slaughterhouse uh, in Somerville. So uh, I still remember some of the environmental impacts when the, uh, unfortunately, when I think there were still pigs that were being slaughtered. Um, but what it did show was basically the transition of immigrants coming into Somerville, how we were community welcoming them, we provided them with employment, and um, the first urban renewal project actually in the United States was down where um, the first national was, there were still a lot of tenements there, and those folks were actually removed, and then we, unfortunately, the city made a mistake with the type of utilization that they put that property to, but it's a, it's a, I appreciate this, and it's good for folks to understand how much some is a microcosm actually for what's going on in, in part in the United States with a lot of the economic trends, how you know, we're trying to accommodate different groups in the community, and one of the keys now for us is to try to apply first affordable housing and also employment for folks. So thank you all for coming, and I hope this is a start of your interest in, in the history of Somerville because it really is fascinating. Just to add on to that, um, my training is as a city planner and one of the things that's kept me in Somerville as long as I've been here is the fact when I first came here, um, it had a very different image and particularly related to the old buildings and I was being told, old oh, buildings, what do we want to do with those? Knock them down, we can do better, let's modernize. Um, and I think what's happened over the several decades that I've been here is that philosophy has changed and now we're adaptively reusing those old buildings and have some real uh, character to them, architecturally as well as memories associated with them and creating new uses in them, like this space as well, uh, which is not historic. I, I don't know if you caught on from Ben, as this is actually a newer building, but a lot of the buildings around here, including the American Two Works, have done that. So I think that's one change that um, the city is trying to take advantage of, is um, keeping those structures and, and preserving um, what they offer. So any other questions um, for Ed? I just have an addition. Um, I, I just want to say that, I think I forgot to mention this, that the Millers River was pretty much completely filled in in 1874. And what prompted that uh, was the creation of the Board of Health, the Massachusetts Board of Health, in 1869. The Millers River problem jump-started our state's Board of Health. And uh, so in 1874, the uh, cities of Cambridge and Somerville uh, you know, filled in what had been the Miller's River. And um, I thought up, up until recently that that meant that there was really nothing left of the river. But apparently there is still some kind of a culvert underground that carries the water and that businesses in the South Street, Webster Street section of the city can he still hear this gurgling water under their uh, basement, so I thought that was really interesting. But it is uh, a forgotten river, lost river. Yeah. It came from partially cutting down the top of Prospect Hill. So, so a lot of Prospect Hill, uh, you know, earthen materials ended up in the Millers River. Cobble Hill, for those who don't know, there's a big development down there, um, senior um, uh, housing down there, and it's very flat right now. It's where the bike path actually goes, and it's wonderful because it is so flat, but that was actually a hill 
um, there are a number of hills in the city of, uh, that were even more than what we have right now. Um, I do want to mention, if you're looking for dessert today, I don't want to give you miss the opportunity for any chocoholics that are here. But there's a wonderful two chocolatiers down the way in Aeronaut, uh, one of whom is actually um, an architect by profession who has a second career in making chocolate called Summer Bowl Chocolate. Uh, he's on the Preservation Commission as well. So if you want to stop down there, and also there's another chocolatier that he rents out space to too. So when you think about dessert. So, um, thank you all very much. Oh, yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the economic dynamic that had Somerville kind of turn into Slummerville and then back out again. What what dynamic kind of had it fall down? In well, the I mean, I mean a lot out. to do with it, obviously, is, is, is the Great Depression and the impact that that had on, on local industry. And you also had things like, um, you know, going to the southern states where there aren't any unions, by the 1920s, you have Somerville factories starting to unionize. So companies are going south, you know, it's kind of like, instead of outsourcing to China, it's like outsourcing to the southern states. And uh, so it, it's, a, it's a combination of things. If you want to learn more about Prospect Hill and uh, um, what's happened over there, we will be doing something um, to celebrate Flag Day, again, for our 175th anniversary. We have a special event happening on June 17th, which is a Saturday from 10 to 12 at the Prospect Hill Tower. Um, the person that actually knows a lot about our flag, which was the first flag of, uh, flown from the United Colonies, which then became the United States, um, we have a speaker coming all the way from St. Louis to talk to us about that. So put that in your calendars as well. There was another question. I saw somebody's hand over there. That, that, yes. Um, I just want to make a quick point about the assembly square. That in, yeah, speak up. That's right. Sorry. In uh, 1944, uh, at the assembly square, <laughs> they were actually manufacturing um, armored uh, universal carriers for World War II at uh, assembly room or assembly square. Sorry. It's not a point. Yeah, please do. Up to the mic. I just wanted to mention um, one more interesting fact about the um, Ford assembly plant in 1944. They were manufacturing armored personnel carriers for World War II. Excellent. Right out of that location as well. Good. Thank you. Yeah, the Assembly Square Mall was a big thing for the city of Somerville. I'm sure Alderman White remembers this. Um, and when it opened, I think it was in 1980. Um, and I remember I was just starting here as a planner, and I was very amused to hear that a lot of the Somerville people were like, when are they going to finish the ceiling in that place? Um, and that's because they retained a lot of the original architecture of the building there. And to this day, of course, it, um, it's all been torn back down and made in big little mini boxes, I guess, and such. But it was a very um, innovative kind of use of an older building for an urban mall for summer. Thank you. Yeah, there's another question. Oh, yeah. Oh, Barbara. Yes. You might want to come up here, Barbara, if you have anything that you want to be heard. Because <laughs> this is um, who I introduced before and waved her hand. This is Barbara Mangum, who is the. Um, the founder of Historic Somerville and now the president of the Board of Trustees of Somerville Museum. Oh. Well, this is a very simple question. Okay. But um, I was just curious, I know that uh, a lot of the brick making that occurred here in Somerville and also I guess in Cambridge, yeah. I've heard that that uh, is really responsible for all the red brick that we see in Boston. Is Defin that true? Definitely, yes. Absolutely. Sanborn bricks. Yes. Okay, did it come also from other areas uh, well, around? Like, you know, I mean, or was it mainly in this kind of area well, along the Mystic the, River, maybe? A, a lot of the brick making, yes, took place in the Jake's brickyards along the Mystic River, but also in um, North Cambridge over near uh, Fresh Pond Circle, that area. That was famous for its, um, for its brick making. That was huge. Yeah. I've also heard that. And, and Medford was really where brick making began as early as the mid um, 1600s. Very early, Medford was a center for brick making. Okay. Is it also along the Mystic? Yes, the, the Mystic has um, a type of soil that has silica in it, 
uh, that is good for, for brick making. I mean, that's really the key, that the soil is unusually good for, for brick making. I just think of clay as being along kind of swampy land. I don't yeah. know. And, and uh, you know, a, a major, major brick maker, Peter Hubel, who had uh, brickyards in uh, northern, um, northern Cambridge, he had uh, a mansion on Monument Square in Charlestown. It's a, it's a double boat front with cupolas uh, right on uh, opposite the monument. And that, his house is kind of a testament to how well he did with his brickyards. And I know that's more about Cambridge history, but I'm trying to think of uh, a Somerville example where some brickyard owner had a house that reflected their prosperity through bricks. I'm, you know, I mean, the Jakes did sort of, but. Um, I've also heard that, um, this, I know in Cambridge, but I think in Somerville and probably elsewhere, that the brick land eventually was taken over by right. cities and turned into public housing areas. Well, I, I know that the, the brick lands were given over to, um, Things like multifamily housing, um, you know, the uh, it, it was it was just lucky that Lincoln Park ended up in 1896 becoming one of Somerville's early early parks in, instead of an area of, of industry, and uh, I, I think that's important to keep in mind. So sandboard uh, bricks you can actually see on some of the sidewalks, I believe, in Somerville, and there's an S on it that represents it. The sandboard, sandboard bricks have the S in them that you can see in some of the sidewalks, and we're actually designing a walking tour for children, um, and one of the things we're asking them to do is to um, find these spot these places and such. Where did they go, the, all the brick manufacturers? We're still getting lots of bricks. What happened? Where, where did the brick manufacturers go? They got wealthy selling their, their brickyards to, uh, for residential housing purposes. I mean, that was the thing. Uh, the land was now more valuable for residential construction, less so for, for industry. Yep. Um, what can you tell us about the historical use of the Maxwell Green site? Of the what? The Maxwell Green site near the uh, new bike path. <laughs> on Somerville Avenue? No, it's um, it's between Cedar. Oh, oh, uh, yes, that was. Um, I forget which industry was there, but yes, alongside the what's going to be the Green Line extension. Yeah, I. I okay, international paper. I'm hearing. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think I heard that it was going to be mixed use housing. I don't want to misspeak, but. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's done. <laughs> We've already done it. Actually, it is housing down there. Um, and there was um, International Paper was one of the places down there. And, and um, Maxwell um, is based on the, what was the name of the other company down there? I'm forgetting the name of the, hmm? Maxpac. That's exactly it. Was Maxwell. Yeah, so Maxpac was the other one that was there. It was right along the railroad spur there. That's what they built. And that is now um, all residential, just in condos. And the nice thing about it is they've created a, a link to the community path as well as a way to get up to the Green Line when it comes to Lowell Street as well. Um, and very much taking advantage of kind of the area to sort of integrate with, um, some green space and open space and such. Um, okay. Um, I do want to remind people that if you would like to be on our mailing list, which I promise you, you will get a lot of uh, mails from us, but for the things that are coming up for historic events and such, I have a uh, list over here. I just appreciate you putting your name and email uh, down if you'd like to. Um, and I'm going to stay around. Ed is going to leave um, yep. within moments. So um, last opportunity for a question to Ed before he takes off. I think Sharon will be staying around as well if you have any other questions for her. Um, another event coming up as well. Um, so, But if not, then I encourage you all to enjoy yourself in this wonderful space and thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you, thank you very much. Seven sodas left if anybody's interested in trying some of this uh, special summer bowl non alcoholic brew um, and a couple of tattoos as well as uh, bookmarks about the company. So come by and help us out.